think uh, the spell, please. Speak to us, Father. Please. Please speak to us. Your word of truth. At this time, as you already have through your holy scriptures. Open up our minds and our hearts that we would discern what you would have us discern. Digest what you would have us digest. That we would go from here today knowing you better, loving you more, and strengthening for deeper service in your name. We pray all this in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, one foggy day, one foggy morning, a few miles off the coast of Florida, uh, two sets of blinking lights seem to be approaching each other. Using Morse code, the first set of lights said, change your course seven degrees east. And the second set of lights responded, change your course seven degrees east. The first set of lights replied, I am an admiral in the United States Navy. Change your course, sir. The second set of lights said, I am not nearly as esteemed as, esteemed as you are, but, but I'm telling you anyway, change your course, sir. And the admiral responded, I am on a USS battleship destroyer. Change your course, sir. The second set of lights replied, with all due respect, I am a lighthouse. You're called, sir. <laughs> Sometimes we are tempted to go our own direction, aren't we? Sometimes we're tempted to try to do things our way. Brothers and sisters, you all know it's so clear in Scripture that, that we are born in sin and we have a sinful nature. Our tendency is to sin, to go against the will of God. Sometimes we try to do things our way instead of the way God wants us to go. That's just a fact. And nobody is exempt from that fact. In our Bible passage for today, Jesus was tempted to do the wrong thing. As the scriptures have told us, he was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, fasting. He didn't have anything at all to eat, nothing. And Satan appears at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, literally appears to him. And he tries to manipulate Jesus because, as I said a little bit earlier, this is Christ's point of weakness. Satan knows that Jesus is desperately hungry, he's obviously physically tired, and he's very weak. And he tries to deceive Jesus, because that's what Satan is very good at, deceiving and deception and lies. And he does this again at Jesus' point of greatest weakness, just as he does to each and every one of us. Be careful when you're weak. Be careful when you're tired. Be careful when you're hungry, and I'm not just talking about food. I'm looking for something that God doesn't want you to have. Be careful when you feel weak, because those are the times in which Satan is looking to pounce and devour. Satan says to Christ, if you are the Son of God, let me put it this way, if you are the Son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. In other words, Jesus, you know your body craves it. You haven't eaten in more than a month. It's going to feel so good to put a little bit of bread in your starving body. So why not, Jesus? If it feels good, go ahead. If it feels good, do it. You have the power. You have the might. Don't you? Remember Christ's response? He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, where Moses is reminding the Hebrews to trust in God rather than their own passions and desires. Moses reminds the Hebrews of a time when they were wandering in the desert for 
40 years. And yes, they were very hungry. In fact, they were on the brink of starvation, so they cried out to God to meet their needs. And what did God do? He met their needs, just as He meets ours. Every one of us. He fed them with manna from heaven. He didn't let them down as he will not let us down. He fed them as he feeds us. He sustained them as he sustains us. He gave them the nourishment they needed to carry on. He gives us the nourishment we need to carry on. Just ask him sincerely. Let me read to you the entire verse from Deuteronomy. Quote, God humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And where do we find the words that come from the mouth of the Lord, brothers and sisters? In Scripture, in the Bible, that's it. That's the only place when Satan confronts Jesus, he sees a man who was starving, tired, and weak. So, at that point, he immediately tempts Jesus by asking, by, excuse me, by attacking his physical <clears throat> desires. The desires of the flesh. We all have desires of the flesh, don't we? Different kinds of desires. Satan knows that if he can get Jesus to eat just a little bit of food, Satan has him. So Satan basically says, it's going to feel so good to your body. You know your body wants it. You know you, your body needs it. Go ahead and do it. Plus, at the same time, you can prove that you are the Son of God. In my opinion, Jesus Christ in his humanity, thought about that moment. Thought about that for just a moment. Don't you know that after 40 days of eating nothing, Jesus' body was telling him, hey, you got to eat. You have to eat. You need some nourishment. But Jesus Christ refused. Why? Because it wasn't his father who was giving him the food. It was Satan himself, the father of all lies, tempting Jesus to get it for himself. You see, if Christ Jesus said, okay, devil, and then he turned some rocks into bread, Jesus would have proved his divinity, but he would also have proved that his ultimate trust was not in his father, but in himself. And at that point, Satan would have had it. Because if Christ cannot be trusted to do the Father's will by going without food, how could he be trusted to do the Father's will by going to the cross? Remember that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was, was sweating what looked like blood? In his humanity, he's saying, Father, take this cup from me. Please, please, I don't want to do it. And then, in his divinity, he says, but not my will, right? My earthly will, my fleshly will, although he was sinless. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And he goes through with it. Now, how did he prepare for that moment? By the Holy Spirit leading him into the desert for him fasting for 40 days, and then allowing Satan to tempt him. Don't you think that the temptation earlier on was a springboard for what was about to take place in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was going to take place three years later? Of course it was. It was a building block, right? Being in the desert was a testing ground for Jesus. Satan knew it, and he tried his hardest to bring Christ down. Early on in his ministry. You see, if, if he had taken Christ down there, the rest of it, we, would, we wouldn't be here today. Tried to get him early. And then tried to get him in the middle. And then tried to bring it home at the end. And boy, he thought he won on Friday, didn't he? But God didn't allow Satan at that point 
to know that Sunday was coming. Friends, have you ever been in the desert? I'm not talking about the Sahara Desert or the Mojave Desert, someplace like that. But have you ever been in the desert of life? I have. A time when you felt kind of lost, a time when you felt unfulfilled, a time when you felt disconnected from other people, maybe even God. Maybe your pain didn't come from hunger, the hunger, physical hunger. Maybe it came from being buried in debt. Maybe you felt caught in a difficult marriage. And Satan comes to you with what you think is a perfectly reasonable thought. He says, hey, 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 hey. You have the power, you have the power to stop your own suffering, don't you? You have the power to get rid of it all, don't you? Hey, if your marriage isn't perfect, have an affair. If your job is a hassle, stop doing your best at your job. Stop giving it your best ever. Just goes to long. Hey, and while you're at it, take home a few office supplies. Had your expense account. <clears throat> also, on your way home, why don't you pick up a boatload of lottery tickets? You see, the more you buy, the better chance you have of winning. Go ahead and cheat on your taxes. Everybody does it. The government is overcharging you anyway. And all they do is waste the money that you give them. In other words, if it feels good, do it. If it looks good, do it. If it sounds good, do it. If it makes sense, do it. The voice of the devil, the voice of Satan himself, can be extremely seductive and appealing. But I beg you, please don't listen to it. Listen to the voice of God that says, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And once again, what do we know comes from the mouth of the Lord? Where do we find that? In Scripture. Come to Bible study and learn more. You won't regret it. The second temptation Satan used on Christ uh, was to stand at the highest point of the temple, which we all know is God's house, and then throw himself off. Satan even quotes scripture. Please don't miss this. This is not written down here. But please don't miss this. Satan knows scripture better than you do and better than I do. Okay? So, knowing that, when you hear somebody quote your scripture, you better know what they're saying and in the context in which they're saying it. You better know what Scripture says in the context of Scripture. Again, I so look forward to seeing all of you at Bible study on Wednesday night. Satan quotes Scripture. Psalm 91, 11 and 12. Saying that if Jesus would just do it, the angels would protect him. They would keep him from falling to the ground and dying. In other words, if Jesus would just throw himself off, knowing the angels would save him, he would prove that he was the Messiah, and many, many, many people would worship him as a miracle worker and know that he was sent by God. They would bow down at his feet, and they would robe him in purple and give him a, a, a golden throne to sit on. If Jesus had chosen Satan's temptation, he could have had been the Messiah without all the trouble. He could have had all the pleasures of power and popularity that so many people these days crave. He could have bypassed dealing with the thick-headed disciples and the hate and rejection and humiliation of the Pharisees. He, would have had to, uh, he wouldn't have had to be humiliated or mocked or persecuted or suffer as we know he did. He could have gotten rid of it all right there. But again, if he did, God's plan of salvation for the world would never have been fulfilled. Again, we wouldn't be here today. Why not? Because Jesus would have avoided the agony, pain, 
suffering, anxiety, and heartbreak that we experience. So we would have known who the Messiah was, but the Messiah would have would not have completely known us. He would not be the one that we can go with our every single struggle, concern, anxiety, problem, frustration, and know how we feel. He wouldn't have been able to do that. So in essence, he would no longer be truly the Messiah. Therefore, there would be an eternal disconnection between us and God the Father. In other words, God would never really know exactly how we feel. And our redemption would never be complete. If Jesus had jumped off the top of the temple, the prophecy of Isaiah 53 would never have been fulfilled, and we would never know the complete extent of God's love for us. To put God. The third temptation Satan used on Jesus was a temptation to live only for the moment. <clears throat> that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Live only for the moment. Now's the time. Forget what lies ahead. Just focus on the short term. Short term is what matters. On here and now. Don't concern yourself with the long term. Don't concern yourself with the future. <clears throat> Many people think that the third temptation of Christ was an offer by Satan to give Christ everything on earth, but that's simply not the case. Satan says to Christ, I'll give you all this, all these kingdoms, if just one time right now you bow down and worship me. You see, Again, but Satan, Satan was not <coughs> telling Jesus that he was going to give Christ the world. Christ already owned the world. Christ made the world. Don't take my word for it. Read John chapter 1, verse 3. Ready? All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He already owned it. You see, it wasn't the world Satan was offering. He was offering the Lord unobstructed power to rule in people's hearts and minds. It wasn't the land. Jesus created that, and it was his. It was the hearts of the people. Satan was telling Jesus that he would back off just for a moment, just for a little while. For the time being, he would remove his evil power and influence from the kingdoms of the world so that Jesus could have his way. And Jesus could then bring peace and hope and joy and contentment and harmony to everybody on earth without Satan interfering whatsoever. And you know something on the surface? That sounds great. Total peace, total joy, complete harmony throughout the entire world. Think about it. No more corrupt governments. No more oppression by evil rulers. No more war. Surely this temptation would appeal to Jesus' heart. But... Here's the cause. If Jesus had said yes to Satan, the Father's plan of salvation would have been lost forever. The world would have been at peace and everyone would get along, but no one would go to heaven. Let me say it one more time. The world would be at peace and everybody would get along, but nobody would go to heaven. Why not? Because Jesus would have followed the will of the devil. He would have submitted to the devil. He would have glorified the devil. Jesus would have sinned against the Father. And once he did that, he could never be our perfect redeemer. In fact, if you think about it, Jesus himself would have needed a redeemer. And his power to save would be lost forever. He would no longer be on the side. He no longer be our Savior. So Christ focused on the long term. 
the long-term effects of his decision, and he decided to put the Father's will above his own, and therefore he rejected the temptation of the devil. And that's exactly what God calls us to do as well. To put his will before our own fleshly desires. And when we hear the voice of the devil, we must resist it. If it doesn't follow the will of God, don't do it. Resist it. It's not God speaking if it's not following the will of God. It's Satan. We must reject his temptations because we know that the, that, that voice comes from the father of all lies. That voice comes from, from the one who wants to seek, who seeks to destroy us and to take us to hell with him. <coughs> Do not let the devil deceive you. Don't let Satan sink his claws into your heart and mind and soul. Do not trust what he says. He is the father of all lies. He will always be evil. He will always seek to hurt you, to bring you down, to destroy your life. And again, his ultimate desire is to take you to hell with him. Don't let him do it. When the devil tries to lead you astray, do exactly what Jesus did with the devil when the devil tempted him. Turn to the Father. Speak the the word of God to him, to him. Listen to God's voice. Obey the word of God. Follow his scriptures. One man, Satan, tried to take to hell, refused to go. Arguably the greatest baseball player who ever lived. Our own Charlie Cobb's grandfather, Ty Cobb. He played 3,033 games. He led the American League in batting average after four years, spent over 400. Please know that a great deal of what has been written about him is completely false. While he was most certainly extremely competitive, he wasn't mean, he wasn't cruel, he wasn't vicious. The fact of the matter is, is that Ty Cobb was a very fine man. He loved his family. He was generous with his money toward those in need. And he would give you the shirt off of his back if you needed it. If you know Charlie Cobb at all, you know, you'll know a lot about what his grandfather was really like. <clears throat> yeah, for some reason, as many good things as Ty Cobb did during his lifetime, as generous as kind and and loving as he was, he, he did not give his life to Christ. That is, until July 17th, 1961. When on his deathbed, he renounced the call of Satan to die without being saved. And he publicly professed his faith in Jesus as his Savior and Lord. And you know what his final words were of? this side of eternity. His final words were, and I quote, You tell the boys I'm sorry. I'm sorry it was the last part of the night when I came to know Christ. I wish I had done it in the first half of the first. This morning I invite you to do what Ty Cobb did. I invite you to renounce Satan and give your life to Christ. And if you have already done that, I invite you to publicly recommit your life. If you feel called to do so, I invite you to pray with me, not read with me, but to pray with me out loud this prayer of salvation that we commit. Let's bow our heads, please. Join with me if the Spirit moves you to do so. Dear Father, 
I confess to you that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I am sorry for my sin, and I am willing to turn from it, but I need your help. I believe that your Son, Jesus, died on the cross to take away my sin, a burden I can never have lifted on my own. I believe Jesus rose from the grave to give me eternal life. I invite Jesus to sit on the throne of my life and to take full control of me. From this moment forward, I promise you that I will live my life completely for Him and Him alone. In His name I pray. 